Hey everybody, I'm Steve, and today I want to talk to you about how to make sure that when you connect third-party services like those you see here to your Next.js site, that you do it in the most optimal possible way, specifically utilizing the best feature Next.js has to offer for each type of service that you might want to connect. You have a lot of options, so I want to give you some guidance on some best practices we've seen. But first, who am I? I'm the co-founder and CEO of Builder.io. We're a visual CMS. Think of it like a headless CMS that additionally has a drag and drop editor like Figma, so you can compose pages and sections of your Next.js site with a drag and drop editor. This is particularly useful for A-B testing and personalization, which we'll cover, but also can be done with structured data like any other headless CMS within Builder. Previously, I ran web engineering for a company called ShopStyle, where we had a large amount of third-party services we depended on for anything from analytics to optimization to content. Back then, we learned the hard way that if you're not thoughtful about the services you connect and how you connect them to your site, it could have a major performance cost. Now, luckily, Next.js has killer features to solve all the pain points I had in the past. So whereas in the past, you may have just added tons of JavaScript tags, one for each service, that is the last thing we want to do today. With Next.js, we both have the script component with multiple strategies that we'll cover. We have a whole range of server-side rendering and static generation options that we will touch on. And we have edge middleware that really makes a difference when it comes to delivering dynamic data at the speed of static. But wait, what is so wrong with script tags? I mean, Next.js is a JavaScript framework, right? Well, the issue specifically is client-side JavaScript and when you have too much of it. For background, this is a chart of the median amount of JavaScript bytes on a website over time. You can see it is very consistently increasing. You might also note that CPU speeds are not increasing necessarily at the same rate. Meaning you could argue by looking at this data that the web is actually getting slower over time, especially for mobile devices, as opposed to faster in some ways. Now, to quantify this impact, we made a simple tool for this. We wanted to understand, of all of the recommendations that, say, Lighthouse gives you, which will most commonly give you the biggest performance impact? If you're like me, you may have gone through many Lighthouse suggestions and found only some actually made a noticeable difference. Many others can be time-consuming and not give us an immediate return on our time. So we made a tool that can modify existing production websites using an edge worker to make changes and see after those changes how much does the performance score and key metrics improve. We found that there were really three most impactful buckets in our tests that if you made sure to optimize all three, we could get almost any existing website to about two seconds time to interactive and over a 90 out of 100 performance score, all tested on a mobile emulated device with Google's PageSpeed Insights tool. You can see an example in front of me where the base performance score is a 35, pretty normal for a large-scale website. In this case, optimizing images such as using next-gen formats, proper sizing and compression, didn't actually change our performance much, so the website had pretty good image optimization already. Similarly, optimizing CSS, which is the middle column, is mostly removing unused styles and making sure we load fonts in the most optimal possible way. That similarly did not move the needle much in this case. Now, the last test is just eliminating JavaScript entirely to show you what is the maximum achievable benefit you can achieve by reducing client-side JavaScript as much as possible. And as you can see here in the second to last column, this was the most impactful factor for this site's performance. Eliminating as much JavaScript from the main thread as possible can increase the performance score and decrease the time to interactive significantly. So you might say that's great for this site, but that doesn't necessarily mean this is the case for other sites. So we tested a lot more sites. Specifically, we chose a list of some of the top 50 e-commerce sites by site traffic. We chose e-commerce because it's pretty well understood in the e-commerce industry that the more you have site performance problems, the more you lose revenue significantly from people bouncing and not purchasing. So these sites need to have good performance. It directly impacts their bottom line, but they also need dynamic features. They need localization. They need personalization and A-B testing. And you can see in our data that the problem we just showed 
is a very common one. The average Lighthouse score of these sites is about a 24. Removing JavaScript as much as possible can bring it as high as an 83. And the TTI down to almost two or two and a half seconds. This is showing a consistent trend of client-side JavaScript being one of the most performance bottlenecks currently today. And to make things worse, a lot of that code running on the main thread is not even your code. You can't control it. You can't optimize it. It could be a third-party script for a vendor that your business truly depends on, but it's actually getting in the way of your code from executing and preventing your users from having the best possible experience. So what do we do about this? Well, this is where the script component can actually help us out. The Next.js script component comes with various strategies for loading scripts in different ways. One of the most interesting strategies, in my opinion, is the experimental worker strategy powered by our project, PartyTown, that we make at Builder.io. The worker strategy can completely remove the performance impact of a third-party script by offloading it to run concurrently on a completely separate thread. It does this through a very lightweight emulation technique to make the worker thread behave more like the main thread so that a lot of scripts can just work as is on the worker thread without needing to actually be on your main thread. PartyTown's currently in beta and not every script will work perfectly. We're working on an official certification process where we can make clear what scripts are known to work great in the PartyTown environments and which you may want to ask your vendor to make some modifications so that it can run in this more performant way. Until then, I would encourage you to just try it. Try putting scripts in the worker strategy with Next.js, and if they behave as expected, that's fantastic. And if they don't, there's other strategies that can still be helpful. When needed, these more stable strategies can still really help to ensure that your code always executes first, and third-party code only executes either after the page is interactive, which is the default strategy, or when the browser is completely idle, which is the lazy onload strategy. While not completely removing the performance impact, it certainly decreases the impact and improves your user's experience. But a key thing to understand here is that the script component is ideal for code that is not render critical. So this is ideal for things that kind of run in the background, such as analytics, where they're not responsible for displaying content above the fold to the end user. Instead, they just run in the background and track analytics and other things. So then what do we do about render critical content, the stuff that our users need to actually see and see as fast as possible? That's where we want to utilize servers, whether it's the edge, a server, or a static generation process, either at build time or incrementally at runtime. In those cases, we can offload as much as possible to the server so that we can deliver to end users instantly from a cache and do as little remaining work as possible in the browser's main thread. So this is really useful for things like CMSs, e-commerce platforms, search platforms, or anything that's supplying content for your users to see from your Next.js site. Next.js provides a variety of features for this. One of the most common methods you'll want to use for this is the get static props function. That way, we collect all this data in advance and can serve it from the edge pre-rendered and not have to fetch anything browser side. Next.js also provides a get server side props function for even more dynamic server rendered data. And with React Server Components, or RSC, we get to also actually fetch data within our components using suspense. Using these can ensure the fastest possible load times for your site. But that's where you may run into one last hiccup, which is you may not want every single visitor of your site to see the same exact pages. Statically pre-generating your pages means everyone who visits your homepage is seeing the same exact content, unless you're fetching additional content client-side, but that's not as fast. There's a delay in the JavaScript loading, the fetch happening, and then the render happening owning in the browser. It can cause layout shifts, and it's just a poor UX and a slower loading experience, which we know does not go well for our metrics, like conversion rates, time on site, or anything like that. So how do we make sure that we let different people see different pages, but still deliver them just as instantly as a static pre-generated page? This is where Next.js's Edge middleware comes to the rescue. 
I personally think this is one of the most amazing features Next.js has ever come up with because this is one file you can add right in your Next.js project. And upon deployment, this file actually gets delivered and runs at the edge, at the CDN, as opposed to at your origin location. Yet it's right there in your project, deployed and managed and version controlled together. With a tiny bit of code, you can do rewrites at the edge. This works amazingly well with services that support A-B testing and personalization, like Builder.io or LaunchDarkly or Google Optimize. And this can be customized in any way that you like. So as opposed to the old way of personalizing pages, where you would do one or several of the following things on the left, such as sending round trips to an origin server, which just takes time for the speed of light through a fiber optic cable to get around the world in the first place. Then fetching and generating personalized content on the fly can add additional time. And even worse, if some of this depends on client-side JavaScript, where you either block the page from being loadable and inject personalized content, or wait for the full application load, then fetch additional content and render it, can really add to the response times and make for a poor UX. Instead, with Edge middleware, we can deliver different variations of content either pre-generated or on-demand generated to different visitors on the same URL. So equally fast as a static page, but as dynamic as you need. So here's a more detailed example of the strategy we use with Builder and have seen great success with. What we do is as you browse the site or maybe via gathering information from a CDP, a customer data platform, we drop cookies with key value pairs and maybe a prefix like personalization.returnVisitor equals true or personalization.shopsmenswear equals true. In this case, cookies provide a great mechanism to share small snippets of data between the browser and the edge so that when we see cookies in a certain format, we can automatically append those key value pairs to the URL path. So now we're rewriting just slash page to slash page with a set of attributes. That allows us to serve a unique page to our visitors who have those attributes. And with incremental static regeneration in Next.js or ISR, we can then fall back. So if we ever see a set of pairs we haven't seen before, we can render it server side. Since those pairs are in our path, we can parse them out. And now when we fetch data with get static props, we know additional attributes and we can send that to various services to get a more tailored response. Now we can respond with that personalized page and it remains in the cache for that set of attributes. So future visitors with the same attributes will get that exact page immediately and we can revalidate it again from time to time in the background or with on-demand ISR, anytime content updates in your CMS or other services, you can immediately ping that page to revalidate to always be up to the second fresh. So here's a more end-to-end -end example. In the case of Builder, instead of just asking for generic data, we can pass through the attributes about the given visitor. Then in Builder's editor, your non-development teams can make variations of any contents based on the attributes we've sent, such as show this variation to logged in users who are menswear shoppers. Then when rendering, you can either render basic structured data, which is what you're used to with a typical headless CMS. You define the structure and add the fields where you like, or generally more fitting to personalization use cases, you can dynamically render composition trees. What this means is Builder can provide a drag and drop editor to allow your non-development teams to compose your React components, your hero here and your products there, and set their props. We then deliver that tree and our Builder component can dynamically render that tree. So from the components you've registered, the tree describes put your hero here and your products there and what props they need, and we'll dynamically populate that. For use cases like personalization or landing page building, this can really reduce development backlogs while maintaining that everything sticks to your design system and your specific development needs. But the same workflow can work with literally any other backend. So within static props, see what special information you have about a visitor and to any backend service, you can pass that through as parameters or queries to make sure we're delivering optimal pages for any type of visitor to our site. So that might sound all lovely, but I'd love to show you an example in practice because I think it's pretty cool. So 
Here I've got a simple site using the Next.js Commerce Starter. It loads really fast. And I've got a few different products on this site. But there's one problem. This homepage is a little bit boring. Every person, whether they like shirts or jackets or have been to this site before or not, is seeing the same exact homepage. What I'd like to do is use Edge middleware to make this page dynamic, but equally fast. So let's pull up the code and go to our middleware file. Here, I've added a very simple set of rewrite logic based on the technique I showed you previously. And I added a console log to show password rewriting from and to. Then over in our product page, on load, we keep track in a cookie of what type of product you've shopped. So in our case, if you're viewing the jacket, we're gonna say, hey, you're in our jacket shopping audience. If you browse shirts, we'll put you in our shirt shopping audience. Now with this tiny bit of setup, we can start creating variations of content to show to these different visitors, either percentage-based with A-B tests or based on your attributes. So now over in Builder, I'm gonna start making variations of content targeted at those attributes we've been setting and running randomized split tests. So we can open up our generic homepage and maybe for these anonymous visitors, I just wanna run an A-B test to see what converts better for brand new visitors to our site. So I make my variation by duplicating this and let's just make a simple 50-50 test. Going back to the visual editor, we'll make very simple changes. For now, I'm just gonna call this test group A as the default. And for our variation one, this will just be test group B. I'll publish that and it'll be live immediately. Now let's make one more variation targeted at our shirt shoppers. I'll duplicate this again. And this time I wanna get more creative with the page structure. I'll go full screen mode and give myself a little more space. And maybe I'll just completely start over. You can see I'm only able to edit between my header and my footer at the bottom. That's because that's where we put the builder component. I'll start by dragging in a hero again and maybe a personalized message like, hello, shirt lover. Now let's recommend a shirt. I'll add a container for some nice spacing and our product cell. This is connected to our e-commerce catalog, so we'll change it to use the shirt. And I really like this slim variation. Next, let's also recommend a jacket that goes well with the shirt. So one more product cell automatically chooses the jacket, but I'd like to add some text next to it that maybe describes that this pairs well with the shirt. I realized I haven't added a component for text. That's where Builder provides primitive elements for text, images, columns, buttons. So let's add the text primitive element. Let's say pairs great with our shirt. And for those of you give design permissions, you can actually get a Figma style editor to change some CSS properties, either connected to your design system of components or freeform. So I'll scale up the text and maybe I'll align it a little bit nicer for our use case. This page is looking pretty good. It's using our design system of components and we did not have to have development tickets to try these variations of the page contents. Now, when I'm all wrapped up, I can target this version of the page to any parameters I want. So this is the information we've been sending. I'm gonna choose audience and shirt shoppers. So that way we have a clear group that this is targeted at just shirt shoppers that we've identified on our site. Publish that and great. Now keep in mind, I showed building a page. You can also use this to build just sections of pages or just use typical CMS structured data. Your standard headless CMS fill in the schema form, but still use the personalization and A-B testing features. Now let's go visit the website. In a brand new browser tab, I can visit the page and get an instant loading new page. Now that my A-B test is live, you can see I'm in test group A. I can open up another browser and you see I land in test group B also served instantly from the edge. Going back to my previous browser, you can see as I navigate around the site, my test group is sticky. So I'm still in test group A in this browser as I navigate anywhere. But if I browse the shirt page, I've now set a cookie that I'm a shirt shopper. So next time I visit the site, I'm gonna instantly get delivered the shirt lover page, that beautiful page that we just made. 
Now, over in our Edge middleware function logs, we can see what was happening that whole time under the hood. For instance, visiting the homepage at slash, rewritten to slash and a hash. The hash includes the parameters that my audience is shirt shopper. I flagged that this is a return visitor and we keep track of the URL path. This is just using normal Next.js root parameters. And in our Next.js get static props, we're fetching the variation of the homepage for the shirt shopper and any other attributes that are relevant. Similarly, as I'm browsing on other pages, like our product page, we're rewriting the standard product URL to the product URL with a hash. That hash has the same info, shirt shopper, return visitor, etc. Pretty exciting stuff if you ask me. So as a conclusion, we talked about using analytics with the scripts component in Next.js, trying the worker strategy when possible, and falling back to the after interactive or lazy onload strategies to reduce the impact of third-party scripts on your site performance and UX. Then for content like CMS, e-commerce, or search, make sure to use server-side rendering or static generation with things like get static props, get server-side props, or React server components. And then for personalization, Edge middleware is here to save the day and ultimately make sure that your site is feature-rich, personalized, but equally fast to a static-generated site. Thank you so much for watching this talk until the end. I hope the subject matter was useful to you and can help you ensure that your site is fast and feature-rich. If you'd like to check out the demo yourself, you can use the QR code in the top right. Otherwise, once again, I'm Steve. Thank you for watching.